Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson. If you're ferociously impatient like me and you want to get straight to the review, I will put the timestamp around my breast area at this very moment. Now, most people watching this are probably very big fans of Elon Musk. The biggest reason I gave this book a chance was admittedly to support Walter Isaacson. Now, something I want to touch on here and a little bit throughout the review is actually another Elon Musk bio. That's right, for those who don't know, there is already a very, very well-known Elon Musk biography by a guy named Ashley Vance. The thing is though, that was eight years ago it came out. And a lot can happen in eight years, especially when you're Elon Musk, say what you want about him, and believe me, it did. At over 20 hours, the Isaacson bio is nearly 80% longer. On top of this, Walter Isaacson is a living legend. His biographies of Steve Jobs, Ben Franklin, Da Vinci, and Einstein are almost indisputably the most impactful of any others of their respected subjects. My point, however, is that most of the time, in my experience as a reviewer, it can be rare to find more than one biography of one person that really comes out on top in terms of influence, education, and just overall coverage in society and culture. When there's already one that did the job, what else is there to do? So let's dive into this and more. How is this book? How did Isaacson do? What can we learn from Musk in this story of his life? What makes him so ambitious and courageous? And hey Elon, it's been a while. What the heck have you been up to in the last eight years? Let's talk about it. Just so you guys know, there are affiliate links in the description, and if you buy anything through those links, like maybe this book, then I get commission, which helps me build this channel and keep making these videos. Welcome back to my channel. My name is Sam, and I wanna make self-growth normal, because people shouldn't have to look this information up. It should just be mainstream knowledge. If you agree, then please make sure to smash that like button. This is gonna have to be what I call a free-form review, because normally, I'll go over each chapter from start to finish, as normally when there are 10 to 15 chapters, it's pretty easy to say at least a few things about each one, but in this book, it's just my luck that Isaacson stuffed 95 dense, dramatic, and action-packed chapters into the thing. To start with, 10 minutes into the prologue, I was just like sucked in. I swear, like if Isaacson's words could paint a picture, I would happily just go into the art museum and stare at it for a day straight. Musk's father, Errol, sounded like a very abusive, disgusting, even kind of racist piece of garbage, exercising what they called an extremely stern streetwise autocracy with his sons, one that Musk ended up grappling with throughout what has been the remainder of his life, developing something like an emotional shutoff valve to shut out fear, but also joy or empathy. His pain threshold exploded in height in the process as well. I don't understand how Twitter is the world's ultimate playground. You talk about this like three different times. Twitter is not the internet. But like his comparing it to the playground that Elon was bullied on as a child and it's like, oh, now, oh, he, now had he had the chance to own the playground. Own the like, I don't know, it was kind of juvenile. Um, this was really my biggest qualm of the entire book. Pretty ridiculous, right? We have reason to believe that Elon is he spent most of his time in a trance not listening. He looks out the window all the time and when I tell him to pay attention, he says, the leaves are turning brown now. Errol replied that Elon was right. The leaves were turning brown. He would zone out and retreat into his own world of thinking. He was using his brain to compute, like not, not in order to process incoming information. He still does this today, but it seems more sporadic. Some things stood out from his childhood later in school, an interest in superheroes and how they would save cities wearing their underwear on the outside of their pants, questioning a lot of things he'd learned regarding religion, and how he plowed through the sci-fi section of the school library and pushed the librarians to order more. He had a whole range of demeanors and mood, nothing whatsoever about his interest in Dungeons and Dragons, science fiction, computers, video games, or anything of the like surprised me. I read it in Audible review that um, unlike the Vance biography, Elon Musk didn't read this one. The thing is, Isaacson did say in, like, an, in, in an interview that Elon is very mercurial, but he never told me not to put anything in the book. Certain moments though in the Vance biography, just, just in this one section, stood out as being ultimately damn near the exact same ones. In this one, almost told the exact same way. During that dark moment in the reception and dance after marrying Justine, he pulled her in and he whispered that, I'm the, I'm the alpha, alpha in, this, in this, relationship. this relationship. Or the time when he pulled out his $1 million McLaren F1, at the time the fastest production car in the world, and Peter Thiel, someone else in the PayPal mafia, he said, tell me about this, uh, this, this $1 million McLaren F1. What can this thing do? And Elon said, watch this. They crashed the whole thing on the side of the road. 
But like these stories and events, they're infamous, some of which he has talked about endlessly in interviews, which always bothered me about like books people write on Steve Jobs and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Jeff Bezos, don't even get me started on Jeff Bezos. That one drives me crazy. If you wanna hear Jeff Bezos say something five times in a row, watch five different interviews with Jeff Bezos, okay? Also the explanation of like causing their companies to accomplish things others couldn't, using what many people call Steve Jobs' reality distortion field. People have been talking about this reality distortion field since like the beginning of Steve Jobs, okay? <laughs> like it's not, you don't need to talk about it in your books. Like no one's ever heard of it. I didn't know the thing that happened with Errol, Elon's dad, and, and his new step family after what happened to Elon's first son, Nevada. That was weird, like very weird. And the way it played out was kind of uncomfortable to listen to, but the way Isaac Sin laid out the whole series of events it was just genius. I also always thought it was interesting that Musk went out with a woman for two weeks before proposing to her and then got married to her twice. And also that he had 11 kids. How many people have 11 kids? It's just things that happen behind the scenes of all the business craziness. Now all of this happened before the business craziness. The rest of the book is for the most part, the business craziness. And that's before he was like, all right, well, that was crazy. Let's get down to business. Something really cool and, 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 and applicable uh, to everyday life that I, I noticed is that a lot of people heard about Musk and they were kind of skeptical before they decided to work with him. Like, oh, he oh, thinks he, he can build, he can an, build electric an electric car. car. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. What so many of them figured out when they looked further into him was, oh my gosh, this guy builds rockets? If you can build a rocket, how hard could it be to build an electric car? Think about it, like how many people know how to build rockets? It's the importance of having a, a resume loaded with the type of experience that can turn heads. If he can do this, he should be able to do this, no problem. But once Tesla started taking off, and I mean really taking off, like around the time that the Model 3 came out, you can really tell how much of a human he was. The whole mad scientist thing where you make manic decisions and say questionable things that lead to jaw-dropping, headline-worthy consequences in his position to really be in to show. But the type of personality he has made it sound totally inevitable. Everything from the Tesla going private, selling stocks for $420 a share, funding secured tweet that cost him $20 million, which he wrote during a time when he was taking sleep medication to working 120 hours a week, spending literally three to four days in a row in the factory during the time of the Model 3 production hell, they called it, to smoking weed in the middle of a Joe Rogan interview, something that was probably just a stupid idea waiting to happen. It was tricky and you could tell, but it gave you a crystal clear picture of his mind in utter turmoil, which is honestly like almost nothing I've ever heard in my entire life. And I've reviewed over 300 books on this channel. Within the realm of just strictly business, such a display of workaholism, stress, and manic behavior altogether has probably never famously affected so many people so deeply. I also really like how when they came up with the Cybertruck design, they originally drew inspiration from old models like the El Camino and uh, the Lotus Esprit. I won't comment on, its, on my thoughts on his look, but it is pretty disappointing that an $820 billion auto manufacturer, the highest on the planet, mind you, more than three times that of Toyota that has actually managed to sell its own mass market models at sky high amounts during a worldwide multi-year auto supply shortage took four years to go from unveiling their electric truck to actually bringing it onto the roads. Now that I think of it, at the making of this video, it's still not even on the roads. Their competitors certainly didn't take that long. But his net worth has exceeded $300 billion in 2022, and he was extremely stressed in ways that those who criticize him just wouldn't understand. A lot of people are like, well, you know, no one in the world should have a billion dollars. But here's the thing, he didn't. And I'll get to that in a second, but what he wanted to do at the time was keep all the money in his companies so he could further, better, and expand humanity and spend all that money on large selfless investments because, hey, your companies, not you, but your companies, will actually need large reserves of cash like that for large decisions in the process of that furthering. What kind of decisions? I don't know, why don't you go ask him yourself and find out? Why the hell else would anyone keep all that money so that no one else could? Do you realize how much money there is in the world? Tens of trillions of dollars in circulation and we're worried about a mere 300 billion, which by the way, he isn't even worth that much anymore. He doesn't choose how much other people invest in Tesla. So he wanted to keep all that money in his companies and not spend it on a lavish lifestyle like some people do as he figured that's 
what makes billionaires really look horrible given everything else going on in the world nowadays. The problem is that by doing that, due to the way that taxes work in our country, he needs to actually sell Tesla stock to realize capital gains, aka make actual money instead of just being worth a lot of money. And if he doesn't do this, he won't pay taxes. And the people who do not want billionaires to exist, believe me, they want him to pay taxes. So here's what he did. He went to Twitter, because he always goes to Twitter all the time for everything ever, and he asked people if they thought he should sell Tesla stock so he could pay taxes, or if he should just keep all his money in the company. 58% of people voted that he should pay taxes, so he paid $11 billion that year in taxes, more than any other American in history, and also more than enough money to pay the salaries of the entire SEC for five years straight. I looked this up and I actually think it's way more than five, but why was it only 11 billion when his net worth was 300 billion? It was just a percentage of how much he made when he sold the stock, because that's how much money he made. A big reason for a lot of this whole decision, mind you, was his anti-capitalist uh, just transitioned daughter, Jenna, saying that she hated him because of, well, I'm sure you can put two and two together as to why. These people who are worth billions of dollars are worth billions of dollars. That is, that's it. It doesn't mean they have billions of dollars on hand. They don't hoard wealth. Their companies hoard investors' money. If none of this really makes sense to you and you don't believe it, look up $1 a year salary. He doesn't control the tax code. Like, if you're gonna complain to anyone about all this, don't complain to him. Did it upset people that he paid $11 billion in taxes that year? Hey, I don't know. It would be good for the balance of a lot of things, in my opinion, if he paid, if he paid billions of dollars in taxes every year and kept billions of dollars in his companies in the meantime. Eventually, his shares of the company would start to go down, but as each share would be worth more over time, his companies will be the ones with the money. And he'll just be straight chilling, like Tim Cook with a net worth of $2 billion, running a $3 trillion company, the most valuable on the planet. Later in the book, you find out that Musk thinks philanthropy is bullshit. Uh, while well, talking to Bill Gates and their sort of um, relationship and how that played out as there's only a 20 cent impact for every dollar you put into it and that he could simply do more for climate change by investing in Tesla. Then there were the times when Musk would show an authoritarian mean dark streak. He was the bad Elon and that I couldn't take. People want me to say I hate him, but it's much more complicated, which I suppose is what makes him interesting. He's a bit of an idealist, right? He has a set of grand visions, whether it's multi-planetary humanity or renewable energy and even free speech. And he has has constructed him for himself a moral and ethical universe that is focused on the delivery of those big goals. I think that makes it hard to villainize him. From what I heard in the book, it really sounded like his use of Twitter totally screwed up his head. I would argue that in terms of what he wants to do with his life, his use of and purchase maybe of it has easily been his biggest downfall or maybe obstacle. Um, not that he's totally screwed. I mean, at one point in the book, he was even like, you know, it's not like I need to be richer. But I think he would have agreed. Even when he was buying it, there was hesitation. He was having second thoughts. He maybe wanted to negotiate, negotiate the price down. You could tell he realized that he wasn't fully confident in the decision. And if you look it up, he even ran Twitter himself until he found someone foolish enough to take his place doing so. Pointing out, um, you know, Elon's tweets about the pronouns and, and Fauci and the other one about, um, about Nancy Pelosi's husband. Kimball said it best when he said that he really doesn't care about Twitter. And that's just a pimple on the of what should be Elon's impact on the world. In the same conversation, Elon said that his main regret from the previous year was how, get this, how often he stabbed himself in the thigh with a fork, how often he shot himself in the feet, and how often he stabbed himself in the eye. He realized, you can tell he realizes how erratic and destructive his behavior can be toward himself and other people, and what came of it. His visions and moves with Twitter, everything from like being an everything app, to um, taking a 10% pay cut for content subscriptions, to the, the merge with X Corp, to the rebranding, it's just not all that interesting to me because I can wrap my head around his fascination with free speech, but just not how it does all that much for the future of humanity compared to his other interests. Because it wasn't on his radar when he was younger, at least not like renewable energy and space exploration were. It just seems more than anything like a justification to pursue the, his, the world's biggest distraction ever from achieving colossal goals regarding those galactic prospects. Humanity becoming interplanetary, seriously? You don't think that could happen faster if he didn't buy Twitter? I could be wrong, but especially with what Isaacson said toward the end, 
about how he gets the most done when he's on edge and stressed out, and the whole thing about what it was what he was called like demon mode. The whole Twitter acquisition, it's really sketch to me. A common mischievous act that many billionaires are infamous for committing, explained with excellence by Mark Fridson in his book How to Be a Billionaire, is what's called a hostile takeover. This is what Elon Musk did with Twitter. If you don't agree with me about the whole thing with Twitter, name one time he took a company from 10 to 100 to 1,000 to a million and further without starting it himself. See? No one can do it. What I'm saying is this is very, very out of character for him. But like in terms of the actual biography, I'm not saying that this blew the Vans biography out of the water. I do think it's a more updated, revised, and mastered account. But again, a lot can happen in eight years. I don't think that's Vans's fault. And the percentage of this book that happened in the last eight years is astounding. I mean, it's mind, it really is mind boggling. In that regard alone, the two biographies are almost nothing alike. It is no wonder why the lengths are so different, but honestly, Isaacson's made it sound like the bulk of Vance's was just the beginning of most of Musk's journey, which is certainly interesting to consider. But I mean, regarding Elon Musk, no matter what they say, the world will see Elon Musk after Mark Zuckerberg, after Jeff Bezos, after Steve Jobs. These people will just keep coming. The world's just gonna keep bringing them to us. But we need to learn what we can from them and their mistakes because I think in a society and culture like ours, I truly believe it's in our best interest for an understanding of what makes us tick at the heights of our influence and what we can make out of what we desire most for our surroundings. Hopefully I will add that the world keeps bringing us Walter Isaacson's along the way. Quotes. Inside the man, there is a child standing in front of his dad. While other entrepreneurs struggled to develop a worldview, he developed a cosmic view. If I didn't study business, I would be forced to work for someone who did. Some of the best innovations come from combining previous innovations. Unlike other ambitious people, he never talked about money. He assumed that he would either be wealthy or broke, but nothing in between. What interested him were the problems he wanted to solve. Personal networks are much more complex than digital ones. A Coke that costs too much doesn't taste as good. He had a good track record of knowing when to ignore naysayers, but not a perfect one. Direction one. If you want to learn about the highs and lows of the life of Elon Musk told from the perspective of a genius biographer, this is the book for you. Stop searching. You found it, okay? Direction two. If you like this book, I recommend checking out Steve Jobs by Walter Isaacson and Elon Musk by Ashley Vance. Elon Musk by Walter Isaacson. There's a link in the description if you guys want to check it out and read the reviews. That and all the other books that I mentioned in this video as well, if you want to check those out too. If there are any other books that you guys want me to check out and review, please let me know in the comments below. Also, let me know if you checked out 